Now, where are we really now in, in, in the engagement? This is now uh, the roadmap. This comes from the perspective of the government until 2006. Um, this covers the transition processes uh, before our president would end his term. Now, where are we now when it comes to uh, the law? Uh, as of now, we have signed a, uh, a memorandum of understanding with the Brown Bus of our Transition Commission to take the lead in conducting public consultations and trying to fit in into what will be the Baxamoro Basic Law. So we are into that until uh, today, until March. Now we are also looking at for civil society in the peace process to be part of legislative agenda building and lobby. We really wanted to develop our own peace champions for Congress to deliver and support the Baxamoro Basic Law. And we are also looking at doing electoral campaign and really mobilizing support but the areas covered in the proposed core territory of the Bangsamoro will really uh, vote in support of uh, the Bangsamoro. And uh, by 2016, we would like to accompany the MILF and the communities there, helping them in the, the party building, doing electoral reforms until the election. 2016 when the Baxamoro government will be established. So that is where we are right now when it comes to formal negotiations, but we're also looking at down there, the arrow there. We have to continue until 2016 and even beyond our peace building and the other public peace processes because our life as a peace worker doesn't only end in uh, the negotiations platform. Now this is just a rundown of our experiences engaging the peace process in Mindanao, and we are into several spheres. Uh, we are influencing the policy, we are really doing actual ceasefire monitoring work. Uh, we, we go to Kuala Lumpur and observe the peace talks. Um, we develop our own agenda, not necessarily being fed into the formal negotiations. Uh, we do a lot of uh, pushing for our presence in actual mechanisms in the transition processes while we conduct peace building on the ground and broadening our own um, peace constituency. But where are we really? We are also inside the key players. This is a, a, a picture of the panels when they are in one of their talks in Kuala Lumpur with the Malaysian facilitator when they say, where are we? Figuratively, we are here. We took notice that the leaders in the panels also come from civil society and we also look at them as peace champions. Um, Chair Ferrer, Ferrer is the head of the negotiating team. Yasmin Bushrao is part of the, uh, the GPH panel, the government negotiating panel, and also under Secretary uh, Chito Gascon. And on the MILF side, we have Professor Abud Linda. Linda is also deeply into doing negotiations, uh, NGO work before um, he went full time with the uh, negotiations. And this is an ethnic person, Dato uh, Tony Kino, who is also uh, a part of the MIL peace process. And uh, that's why I put it that online because he's not really doing doing civil society work, but he is really involved with promoting IP or the ethnic rights. So where are we also in the Transition Commission? This is a parallel, this is a structure now trying to develop the Bangsamoro Basic Law. So uh, there is a parallel council inside, so there are the MILF uh, appointed commissioners and uh, the government appointed commissioners. Where is civil society there? We are also there. Of course in the person of our own secretary of the Peace Committee, or what we call the Office of the Presidential Advisor on the Peace Process. And we also have an, an ethnic national inside the MILF. Uh, that guy comes from inside the core territory of Bangsamoro. We have also a Bangsamoro woman, the attorney Raisa, 
uh, who is one of the MIF consultants and is also presently the commissioner of the Transition Commission and also an IP or an ethnic national uh, who is a commissioner. And this commissioner is the only non-MILF commissioner in the transition commission. Now, but because this is also a rundown of the gaps that we have in the Bangsamoa peace process, and this one is how do how do we sustain as a pressure group? Civil society doing uh, uh, peace work uh, in really engaging the, the two actors in conflict so that, we, that the process can be more transparent, can be more inclusive, and can bring in the, the, the local voice. And this also this, uh, I'm sorry, this constant challenge of uh, right now, that what we're feeling is, when the process brings in the technical expertise, especially in the drafting of technical documents, civil society is slowly eased out. When, we, when the government and the MIL have signed the framework agreement of the Bank Samoro, in 2012, uh, we don't know what's happening in the negotiations because they're trying to bring in their own experts, trying to draft. So uh, there's this challenge in the last two years uh, in making the talks transparent. And there is this seeming reluctance to concede space, a bigger space, and even the control of the negotiations process, especially the wider group of participants, especially now that there's this uh, emerging issue and emerging discourse on the autom autonomy within the autonomy. Uh, there's this the voice of the ethnic nationals part of the poor territory. They're trying to also look for ways to be heard because uh, they wanted to really assert that they have to have their own customary land holdings be recognized and processed, uh, which should be considered as part of their ancestral domain. But the negotiations uh, hasn't included that. So there is a, a major issue now inside the proposed core territory and that which leads us to the issue of inclusiveness. Another peace process and that of with the model national liberation plan is yet to end. They also have their own uh, uh, problems being raised uh, to the government and there's this issue of conflicting and uh, competing laws on land. Uh, land rights and even the uh, the ownership and management of natural resources. There's a continuing problem on opportunities just around the block trying to make the process. And this uh, challenge of how to make the unpopular popular to the Christian majority. When we say Christian majority, not only in the core territory, not only in Mindanao, but here in the Philippines. Uh, and how do we really truly lay the ground for real healing processes in the transitional transformative justice that both parties are trying to hammer out in the peace agreement. Uh, I tried to put here uh, some sort of a, an interface of the, the, the milestones that poor Mike Bangsamoro uh, has been into in the last how many years, decades. Now, the Burma, when it comes to trying to draft or frame their own negotiations agenda, the legacy of the Bangla agreement is there, but it is still, they are still wanting of more civilian supremacy and civilian voice in that, but it still is, the spirit is very important to keep that, that spirit alive. For the Bangla all of the frameworks help, the framework agreements help in defining the political agenda of the Bangla um, and the social reform agenda of the previous administration trying to promote the six pathways to peace, the framework agreements from the previous peace processes and even the process with the communists uh, would also broaden what is really the political agenda of the peoples when it comes to settling the uh, centuries old conflict here in the Philippines. Now, but my question here for our speaker is uh, in this, in this. Uh, with, with this kind, with the, with the framework setting, what, how do we shape the new Panglong Agreement? Uh, Madam, I know you already have your own uh, draft uh, framework agreement, but uh, for you, who is key? Because you're talking about union here, the union. Who is key in determining or articulating the political agenda of the world of these talks? The second is, uh, 
uh, there's a need for the civil society to consistently feed into the process, the civilian bottom lines, the civilian agenda. And it's very, there are a lot of contentious issues and because the vulnerabilities are high. So issues pertaining to that of the political prisoners, the refugees, other vulnerable sectors, women, labor, migrant issues for that matter, and uh, what's the stake of the civil society there in the policy processes. Next, in terms of outcomes of the peace processes and who are there leading the process, Burma is promoting, is trying to, to fight for political autonomy of the 135 plus plus ethnic nationals. And this means multi multiple actors uh, negotiating, claiming as one. Well. Now, but there has to be a balanced presentation uh, in achieving our self-determination goals and the Bangsa model uh, opted for politically negotiated sector and its greater autonomy this time. Uh, that the, the call for independence is uh, being shelled, uh, except for the MNLF faction trying to promote that. And right now, MILF leads in the process among the armed non-state actors. But it's, an, it's a reality that there's an overlapping peace processes negotiating the same space and negotiating the same uh, people. So we are into that dilemma. I would like to pose this question and this aspect of what is uh, the imperative of ceasefire now in the Burma peace processes. Uh, you are supposed to sign the national ceasefire, but what is taking it so long? Uh, and we've heard that the, 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 the signing of the national ceasefire is in the offing, that it will also be good, uh, uh, your perspective on this. And how, what, what are the challenges in making the inclusive, inclusiveness of this uh, UNFC, or the United Nationalities, Nationalities Federal Council? Uh, this is now the platform, the consortium of the ethnic nationals in Burma. And what are the challenges there? And that the, the outcomes of the peace process towards autonomy requires ownership and vision of the civilians in the communities. We already mentioned the imperative of the local participation and the local voice. And in terms of dialogues and social mobilization in Burma, there have already been, the civil society have already expressed and articulated and even drafted their own peace agreement and framework. Roadmaps leading towards an inclusive and broad um, this process inside Burma. It's an inclusive, nationwide, and uh, involving political dialogue. And in Pansamoro, there is an ongoing dialogue at all levels, and roadmaps are already being set towards transition as talks are, are coming to close. And we put a uh, crucial stake in setting up commis uh, communication strategy bringing in the help of international experts and companions and even uh, maintaining good relationship with external fac Malaysian facilitators. So there's this uh, a great those amount of goodwill and trust in the peace process. Uh, and the greater there is greater consensus on uh, in not only the contentious issues and it has already become a public agenda. Now but the question is what in in Burma, what is the locus of civil society in the entire dialogue processes up to the Panglong conference before the election. Are you only relying on the official processes, the political dialogue and the national dialogue processes, as the, the only processes that you trust and believe? Would you think uh, that civil society will still continue some sort of a parallel process where civil society takes the lead? And uh, this is just a rundown of uh, uh, some other poster questions. Is there a need for an independent civil society, a broad engager, a broad constituency, and reach out? Who is who, uh, who can the who have this listening ear of both actors? Um, how are, are we really that independent? And can we harness this strength and energy and synergies of the intra civil society linkages, whether inside and outside the border? inside Burma and at the border, inter-ethnic device, interfaith, and the multi-sexual uh, linkages, especially among youth and women, 
who are one of the pillars in the civil society, can be considered women at the peace table. Uh, though some, uh, Senor mentioned something about the public announcement that the committees uh, have announced that women will be part of uh, the peace table. So uh, that ends my sharing, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much to our speaker, Pai Seng Rao and our director, Ms. Prieto. Um, I think before we open the forum, uh, we should give a chance to uh, our speaker to react to the questions which were raised. that you have gained um, in the Philippines, especially, you know, uh, when I look at the process, you have already involved all stakeholders, <coughs> and then also from the very beginning, you have the uh, monitoring mechanism, and then also you already have a agreed uh, framework to start the dialogue. So I think uh, these are issues that we are still lacking, and in your experience, I'm sure you know that it takes time to to really establish such a such a uh, platform. So uh, yeah. So compared to your uh, uh, status, I think or the stage, uh, I think Myanmar is still left behind, and we still have to do lots of work in this. And you. One question I got was, who is determining, determining the political agenda? We are not there yet. We are still at the ceasefire issues. Yeah? And uh, as I've said, uh, ceasefire can be established among the armies, among the military people. So, and even though they do not include us, I think that's fine. But the problem is if they do not involve, uh, if they do not involve independent monitoring mechanism, uh, it would be very difficult to be successfully maintaining the ceasefire. And it may be the first country that would be, if successful, <laughs> without the monitoring, independent monitoring system in place, it may be the first country that achieved success without that. You know? So I think uh, many, many countries successful since Spain over 50 nations, if you look at it, you know, that they always have independent monitoring system. So we are not that yet. So uh, if you asked who is determining, determining the political agenda, we are not there yet. And we really hope after the, uh, the comprehensive peace process should include lots of steps. Ceasefire is one. And after the ceasefire, there would be like uh, uh, mine action, for example, and then return and resettlement program. Lots of these issues should be involved the real stakeholders, including the IDP themselves. And, <coughs> You talk about maintaining an inclusive uh, United Force like UNFC. I think uh, UNFC is not inclusive, so to say. Uh, it is not all the armed groups are there. Uh, so when you talk about nationwide ceasefires, it has to include uh, members of UNFC, non members of UNFC. You just cannot leave out the one, for example, uh, which is crucial because they are, by arms being the strongest, uh, and has the Chinese backing. So uh, I think uh, these are issues that one, when you want to say Mission Mat is fine, you cannot leave out any numbers. Also now, for me, uh, the government has addressed the People's Malaysia troops. The People's Malaysians are uh, are the created by the government. And what is the status? 
once uh, in the once the nation once is fire is signed, but they withdraw these uh, people's militia troops, and there are also uh, village volunteer groups that form on their own ways to defend their homes and families from the encroaching government uh, troops. So what about them? Mm -hmm. So these are the issues has to be considered. Um, yes, the towards autonomy, uh, greater autonomy we are talking about, it requires the ownership of the ambition of the civilians, the communities. And uh, are we only, should we only rely on the official processes? No, because uh, it has to be uh, official, non-official, uh, parliament, non -par outside parliament discussions must be there. And how, whatever agreement made outside of parliament, how that can be legalized must also be discussed. Uh, I would say before the, uh, before the ceasefire. Because, uh, as we all know, Parliament is uh, the, the greatest block in Parliament is uh, the military. Mm -hmm. So whatever you make agreement has to be approved by the Parliament. If so, then there could be some issues that must be just agreed between the President and the East Negotiation Team mm -hmm. and the, the uh, ceasefire Negotiation Team from the Arabs. And there could be issues that must be agreed by the states and region parliaments and there could be also that has to be really approved in the uh, main parliament. Uh, Woman as a peace table, uh, it has been now mentioned uh, but it has not been a legal uh, issue right now but as I said the, we are still at the ceasefire status and uh, you, you were saying that there has been ceasefire. Why it has been dragging? Who is holding that? So I would say uh, the problem is the government are not united. Uh, the government has uh, three pillars: uh, the military, the executive branch, the president, and the parliament. They should be united in the negotiations. For example, if the executive branch of the president signed a code of contract two and a half years ago with the Quran, um, that has not been implemented. And if there's an agreement made of uh, the uh, ceasefires with the KIO, still in the front line, the Tamador is uh, yeah, encroaching and still using violence as a means to to uh, take up the territory. So these are the issues that the government needs to be uh, united and uh, you know, uh, have involved or most stakeholders from the government sides as well. Okay, thank you.